I'm Josh Yance. I'm Mickey Emerson. And we want to welcome you to Table Talk. We've got a thrilling show for you today. Mick, how you doing, brother? I'm doing wonderful. How you doing? Better than I deserve. Yeah, amen to that. Let, thank God for God's grace. And hey, uh, real quick, before we press on, I would love to encourage everyone out there to please hit the like button, subscribe button, leave comments, questions, critiques, I don't care what. Uh, let us know you're out there. Uh, give us some love because we love you, all right? Amen. Somebody said one time, Mick, they said, what do you know about God? I said, well, I'd like to tell you all the things that I don't know about God. <laughs> but here's what I know. You ready? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. I've heard that somewhere. Amen. I like it. I want to tell you about this coffee that we are drinking. <laughs> Pre-show, we are having a little bit of discussion about <laughs> coffee. I came in the studio. I was a little bit late tonight. And upon arrival, I was meted by... Uh, Did you say meted? Or greeted. <laughs> greeted. My goodness. Greeted by Jared and Mickey... Oh. And Mickey you desired to make me a cup of coffee. I love coffee. Now, last time, last show we had, I drank some of this coffee, and I was up till about 1.30 in the morning. Nevertheless, I agreed. <laughs> and this is the coffee that we are drinking. Black Rifle. Black Rifle. This was purchased by one of the elders, Danny Alvis. Mm -hmm. So, Danny. Thank you, Danny. Mickey says thank you. He's already had five cups before the show. Just kidding. This is beyond black. This stuff is intense. Strong coffee. Anyways, we have an enigma tonight. The mystery show. <clears throat> so, Wednesday, Wednesday Night Biblical Studies last night, I asked you, I said, do you have a topic? And you said, yeah. Would you like to know <laughs> why haven't you texted me your topic? And I said... Why don't we just make it a surprise? Yeah. So, here we go. I was told to go first. Are you ready? Yeah. He discovered my topic uh, right before uh, we turned on the camera, and I still don't know what his topic is. So, uh, get ready for the deer in the headlights look, all right? Here it is. Talking to Okay. So, we've got a neighbor over where we live. And his name is Bill. Bill goes to the Baptist church. Um, very nice guy. And he calls himself Bicycle Bill. December of 2020. I know Bicycle Bill. Okay, so you know who this is. Very nice man. Yeah, he's one of our, he's a great customer. Okay. December 2020, Bill writes me this note. Preacher, Josh, and family. I thought this might be nice in your new office. But it is entirely up to you where you want to hang it. Thanks for the book, which I really enjoy. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Bicycle Bill. Not to mention the beautiful penmanship. I mean, look at that. Just, that is just nice. That's, that's, that's in cursive. That's beautiful. Yeah. That could be a topic, cursive writing. A lot of people don't do that anymore. Anyways... This was the gift. That's lovely. He did that himself, didn't he? He did. Because I, I know he he, uh, he knits and whatnot. Yeah, so I wanted to bring that tonight and show this. Uh, obviously, it says uh, peace. And it's got a sheep and a, a wreath here. A lot of symbolic imagery here. And then the 2020 down here. And then his little initials. Um, but this is just a beautiful piece, hand-stitched. It's awesome. Um, he said he got the frame at Hobby Lobby. And um, I hung it up in my office last year for Christmas and stored it away. I, about February, I took it down. Uh, beginning of February, I think. And I just hung it up again, I think, uh, last week or something like that. Um, I love this. I, I just love this. And he, he hand-delivered it in this box, my goodness, that was just amazing. And I just wanted to brag about this and um, peace and what a wonderful time of the year to think about peace. And, and I want to talk about that. What, here's what really prompted me to do this, Mickey. 
I did not know about what I was going to do until today. And I go to the mailbox today, and I get this. From Bicycle Bill. From Bicycle Bill. And it says Noel. And it's just a nice little card, and it's hand-stitched here by Bill. He, he, it's got the little mesh netting thing here, and um, it's big font. And here's what it says, 2021, Josh and family, may your Christmas be merry and your new year happy. Bicycle Bill Stewart. And I sit on the front porch because it was such a beautiful day. It was 70 degrees here in Peakyville, my goodness. And um, I sit on the porch and just contemplated this and thought, Noel, Noel, what, what, what does Noel mean? We see Noel, what, you know what I mean? What, what does it mean? And um, I think it's a Latin term, but basically means nativity or, or uh, joy and uh, Christmas caroling or even related to birthday. Mm -hmm. The uh, first Noel. The first Noel. And um, I don't know. I just wanted to share that and look at a couple of scriptures in regards to peace and um, tying in the, the incarnation and the, uh, the coming of Christ and uh, thinking about peace. Peace. And I want to turn to Romans 5 and... Uh, I have no notes. This is not scripted. I, I don't. Which is good because he, he always comes up so prepared and makes me look sophomoric in, in my approach. So I, I appreciate that uh, he's cutting me some slack tonight. Oh Thank my God. Well, brother. Um, yeah, so here, here's what I want to think about. Just a couple little quick pointers when we think about the coming of Christ, and he came, you know, what day, okay, I don't know, uh, was it, you know, December 25th, probably not, but, you know, that's totally irrelevant, I think, uh, the point is, he came, and history bears that out, but I want to think about peace, and, and, and thinking about Bicycle Bill, and um, thinking about Jesus Christ, Paul said, came to save sinners, and history bears out, the God-man came, he, he came, and I want to think about the peace of God. And um, I want to think about two different types of peace. I want to think about an objective peace, which is outside of us. And I want to think about a subjective peace, which is inside of us. All right? Mm -hmm. So objective, meaning outside of us. Easy enough to understand. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, what? Therefore, what? Why is that therefore? Because of Romans 4, he's been talking about uh, justification and the faith of Abraham. And then he ties it back in with the end verses of being raised from Jesus Christ was raised for, from the dead. Why? Because of our justification. Now, Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified. What's that mean? It means in right standing with God. God slapping the gavel and looking at the sinner and declaring them no penalty for them. Therefore, having been justified, now that's not universally. That's for those who have received Christ on God's terms and of pardon, okay? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what with God? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I would refer to as a gavel-slapping peace. That is an objective peace because therefore when we are repent and are baptized and are walking faithfully with Christ. We've heard, we've confessed, we believe, okay? Therefore, God slaps the gavel. The blood of Christ has been applied. The imputed righteousness has been applied. The gift of Holy Spirit is our seal. God slaps the gavel and says, no penalty for you because Jesus Christ, the righteous one, has met all the righteous requirements that we could not fulfill, as you know. God slaps the gavel and says, no penalty for you. You are at peace in terms, in right terms with God. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He suffered the consequences. You and I have broken the law. 
and we get to escape the consequences because of the grace system of salvation. And uh, yeah, you you had just sorry real no, no, quick you're fine. to interject. That's all I got on the you had said that it's not a universal thing, and I just wanted to uh, bring it up, give our listeners a reason why it's not universal. Because if you were to go up to chapter four, verse twenty-four, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited. So who is it that receives this peace? Who is it that gets the credit? That's right. <clears throat> Those who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Yes. And, uh, so to believe. Uh, which is what you had just said to hear, believe, repent, be baptized, all yeah. of those things that come along with the belief uh, in our Holy Father. Praise so God. That's that's all I wanted to interject. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat. Peace? Yes. An objective peace, first and foremost. Right standing with God. But, there's also, this is the, so, the beauty of God, he gives us a subjective peace too. Look at John 14. Okay, Mickey, I'll ask that you read John 14, 26 and 27, please. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That's right. So Jesus and Jesus is talking about a subjective peace, a peace within us here, and that is what overcomes um, anxiety, fears, worries, doubts that you may be having. Pray for the peace of Christ. But that's only going to come after you've been born again. That objective peace has to happen first. Amen? Amen. And uh, so just thinking about that as we are coming into this Christmas spirit and thinking about uh, so many times we want to put the cart before the horse here with the subjective peace being first. Mm -hmm. um, but that objective peace has got to come first. And I know you're like, well, duh, I already know all that. Well, good. We need to be reminded. And we need to stir one another up by way of reminder with that. And not only is it an objective peace with God, a subjective peace he leaves with us to let your hearts be troubled, but also, Paul says in Romans that we are to pursue peace with all men. So this is something that, that we are to also be extending to others. And blessed are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. So this is, a, this is a big deal. This isn't just some little Christmas word on a banner. This has rich theological implications here. Um, not only just for, for some little head knowledge thing, but this is, this is to the head, to the heart, and then we activate to the will that peace unto others. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, man. Just really cool. So that's really all I got. That's enough. I appreciate that. Amen. I thank you. Thank you, brother. And, and thank you, Bicycle <clears throat> Bill. Bicycle Bill, man. And that's wonderful. Praise God. He talked about peace, and I'm going to tell you what. I'm also going to have have a little uh, piece of peace. Okay. Piece of peace. You like that? Piece of pizza. Uh, <laughs> um, piece of pizza. When... Uh, when I was a kid, when I was a little kid, I was about my son's age, like six years old, uh, my mother would take me to flea markets, antique shows, stuff like that. We got a local uh, junior college called John A. Logan. And uh, when I was a kid, they'd have, they had they had things there all the time that they don't have anymore, like baseball card shows. You'd go to a baseball card show and you'd have thousands of baseball cards and memorabilia and you'd have a couple of St. Louis Cardinals there signing autographs, stuff like that. But they'd also have like antique shows and, and whatnot. And I picked up a wonderful gym. When I was a kid, they had those metal lunch boxes that the, they don't carry anymore. But it was a metal lunch box that had the, like the the clasp uh, that held the lid shut, and it had uh, our 37th president Richard Milhouse Nixon on that lunch box. And don't ask me why. For whatever reason, one reason or other, I was drawn to that lunchbox, and I just thought that was cool, and I had to have it. Hmm. And along with, with that, there I also had, like, buttons. Um, once upon a time, uh, our politicians, when they would run for office, they, they would hand out oh, little yeah. buttons. You'd put a button on your jacket or whatever. I like Ike, stuff like that, you know. And so you get, I had one that had uh, Spiro Agnew. A lot of people don't know who Spiro Agnew is. He, he was... 
uh, vice president for Richard Nixon before Gerald Ford came along. Uh, I had a, I had an Agnew uh, pin, but anyway, Richard Nixon for whatever reason got my attention when I was a kid, and later on, as a senior in high school, uh, I had uh, developed a, an appreciation for politics and for the law, and I had the opportunity to listen to our great president speak alongside he, uh, another gentleman by the name of F. Lee Bailey, who was a famed attorney. Uh, he, he, he was so good at his craft that he had his own private jet. That's how good of an attorney F. Lee Bailey was. He was incredible. Uh, but they were good friends, and they spoke one another because a lot of people don't know that uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon was also an attorney uh, before he became a politician. Um, what in the world does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with peace? And we're going to get to that. Uh, because I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to tie it into peace, and I'm also going to tie him into Simon the Sorcerer. So if you folks can go ahead, be good. <laughs> if you'd like to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter eight, um, what we have, we're, I, I don't know where to start first. If I want to start with Nixon first, if I want to start with Simon first, I don't suppose it really matters. But I'm not going to read verse for verse. But in Acts chapter eight, uh, verses nine through I think twenty-four, uh, you get. Uh, the story of a gentleman named Simon, uh, who was a magician, who was, was crafty in his art, and he thought a lot of himself, um, but then it, it said he used to be, you know, like, like he used to be a performer, he used to perform so, uh, um, what's, uh, sorcery. Yeah. Uh, so maybe he was getting a little, uh, not maybe not feeling as, as great about himself, he was starting to lose... Uh, some uh, self-esteem, I don't know, but mm -hmm. the apostles are coming along, and he he's catching on to the apostles, and it says he believed. Mm -hmm. All right, when the apostles came along, he believed, and I believe he was immersed, and yeah. he when he saw that the apostles could bestow the gift of the Holy Spirit on people by laying their hands on, he said, "Hey, let me give you some money. You can lay your hands on me, and then I can do that stuff too." And and they say, hey, may, may all of your silver be buried with you, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and uh, so they kind of rebuked him for that. And I'll tell you what, he, he repented of that. Mm -hmm. He repented. In the end, he repented and said, pray in the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Right. And so we had a gentleman uh, who kind of who, who followed... The apostles for a period of time, so he was faithful for a period of time. But then, uh, his heart was hardened for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But then he came back, and uh, he he found repentance. Uh, what in goodness' sake does that have to do with Richard Nixon? Well, I don't really know. I don't know that it does, but I feel like I can tie the two together. See, Richard Nixon was from a place called Whittier, California. And he was a Quaker. Now, when you think Quaker, I, I don't know a lot about the faith, but I, th I think Quaker, I think like Pennsylvania, I think out east. Mm -hmm. um, and Danny, Danny Elvis, our, our elders, said, how can he be a Quaker? They, they don't procreate. Right. And I, I don't know. I don't know. Right. Well, what I do know is that when they ventured out west, the Quakers, that is, they became more liberal they become more relaxed mm -hmm. i don't want to say liberal they became more relaxed well, in their faith yeah, kind, yeah. kind of like i uh told somebody today i don't know if it was jared or another guy at the store i, I said i i kind of equate that to the the mennonites to the amish sure you know they, they just become a little more relaxed like tennis shoes they wear sneakers sure yeah. they drive vehicles uh rather than the horsing i think they have cell phones too they they do yeah they do and they're wonderful workers yeah um but um nixon Grew up in Whittier, California. His dad was a shop owner. Um, I can't remember what kind of shop he owned. But his mother was more devout in her faith than his dad. And he was kind of a mama's boy. And so he, uh, he gravitated towards that faith because, because of his mother. And uh, so he, he led a lifestyle a lot like ours. Uh, like we do today. At Bible study every Wednesday night, morning service, evening service. Uh, had youth group things, you know, he was connected to the church out there in Whittier. And uh, 
Then he went off to college. He, uh, he had a full ride to Harvard. But his dad had grown ill, and he wanted to stay closer to his dad. And so he chose to go to Whittier College right there in town. And they paid for his full tuition right there in Whittier. So he, he gave up Harvard uh, to stay home with his dad. Um, and while he was there, um, he, uh, let me see, he graduated and then he got a scholarship to Duke University. At the time, Duke was new, was, was a new campus. And uh, he, he, he was an exceptional student and he got a free ride to their law school. So he goes to Duke Law School and is an exceptional student there as well. Um, but he was kind of shunned when he was there, uh, because they only had a handful of activities. Uh, they didn't have the fraternities and sororities like we do today. So they only had one or two, and I think there was only one for the men. And he wasn't permitted because he didn't come from a prestigious, uh, family. And so they kind of shunned him. So he just started his own. He started his own, uh, group fraternity. Um, and I don't know if he carried that you know, that chip on his shoulder uh, later in life or not. Um, but I know that he kind of became a hard man. He was known as, as a hard, hard-nosed hard politician. Um, but when he went back to Whittier after law school, he began studying law right there in town. And after just one year of studying law, he went on to found his own law firm. He, he became a partner in that law firm after just one year. He, he was an incredible attorney. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, he is the first attorney, just, just a little useless knowledge for you, he is the first attorney to successfully use a lie detector test in a defense case. Really? He was the first, he was the first attorney to ever do that. Oh. Um, Interesting. So that, that's neither here nor there, but he went off and uh, then he... Uh, him and his wife moved to D.C. He, he met Pat, Pat Nixon. Uh, well, he was, he was doing a stage show, I think. I think he, he was performing, like, doing, uh, like, a, a theater group or something like that. I don't know, but somehow, somehow like that, he met his wife, Pat. Yeah, a man of many coats. He was. He really was. And when he went to D.C., he had a job doing something mundane that I don't recall, but he didn't like it. Right. And he wound up, uh, World War II comes along, and because of his faith, because he was a Quaker, mm -hmm. and also because he was a government employee at that time, he could have foregone the draft, but he chose not to. Not only did he not forego the draft, but he enlisted in the United States Navy, uh, Navy Reserve, as an officer, and received exemplary marks all through his career in the Navy. And uh, when he got out, immediately after he got out in 43, 44, something like that, he ran for Congress back in California, and he won uh, by like 20-plus percentage points. It was a landslide victory over his Democratic point, uh, opponent. Wow. Uh, so he runs for Congress, and then he runs for Senate, and then he becomes the he, he gets tagged by Ike, uh, to be his VP, and so he becomes Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. Right. Um, and uh, so then as he goes on to become president, of course, in 1969, after uh, first losing to John F. Kennedy, uh, whose dad actually stole that election, uh, there, were, there was uh, shades of voter fraud in Texas and Illinois at that time because Joe Kennedy had bought the unions in Cook County uh, to help JFK make it over that hump, and that's neither here nor there. He won the election. Uh, he, he, I'm sure he was a fine president. Um, but President Nixon chose not to pursue the voter fraud um, allegations mm -hmm. because he did not want America to look bad. He felt that would make America look bad, and so he chose not to do that. I commend him for that. Um, and what does any of this have to do with Simon the Sorcerer, you say? Well, he was finally elected in 1969, all right, and he took his Quaker faith with him. Now, Quakers have have a uh, uh, are known for their their peaceful nature, 
almost like like a social justice sort of thing. They, they want everybody to get along and be happy. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to make waves. And, well, he had run on a, uh, a justice sort of stage. Mm -hmm. You know, he had ousted the communists and said, you know, we're, we're going to have peace. We're, we're not going to have this anarchy going around. We're, we're going to have peace. Um, but he took office in the midst of the Vietnam War, which was far from peaceful. Yeah. And upon his exit from office in 74, he bombed the snot out of Cambodia, which was also far from peaceful. Okay. Now, in his time in the Oval Office, you're talking about an talk about an enigma, like you said at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. During his time in the Oval Office, he was troubled by actions that he had to take as president. They, they, they bothered him. And there's a story of one evening he ventured out of the White House on his own. There, there's a tunnel that goes underneath the lawn. He ventured out and he had his driver take him and he come across, was it the Washington Memorial? And there were protesters, Vietnam protesters. He spent time with those Vietnam protesters in the middle of the night, the President of the United States, without a security detail, and he asked them for their story. He said, please tell me your concerns. Mm -hmm. He was generally concerned for what they had to say. A lot of people, if, if you were to look at Richard Nixon, his interviews, listen to his tapes, his expletive-filled uh, rants, would not think that this would be a guy that would walk up to some hippies in 1970 and 71 and say, uh, tell me how you feel. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. You know, like he's Sigmund Freud or something. But he leaves there and he goes to, I think it was the Lincoln Memorial, and comes across a woman who was a, uh, she was a cleaner. She was a cleaning lady there. And she just so happened to have her Bible. And he autographed her Bible. She asked him to autograph her Bible, mm -hmm. which I thought was awkward. But he, he did. Um, and so... During his time in the Oval Office, he, he had uh, befriended Billy Graham and Pat Robertson. Um, him and Billy Graham were good friends. And he would use Billy Graham to make him look good. To make him look more faithful and more Christian than he really was. <laughs> All right. Uh, truth be told, while he was in office, even when he had gone off to college, uh, his faith had taken a toll. Um, he believed in a God. He believed in a creator. Right. But he did not believe in the infallible, indestructible word of God. All right. Um, so he knew there was something up there bigger than him, but um, he had strayed quite a ways from him, what his, the way his mother had raised him. Mm -hmm. And he would use Billy Graham, like I said, to make him look good. Uh, and Pat Robertson later on, and Pat Robertson uh, admonished him in his later days after his resignation, said, you need to apologize to the American people, you need to take credit uh, for your uh, your actions, and uh, you need to ask for mercy, and uh, Nixon, uh, he made a lot of excuses, and he never really wanted to do that. Um, but that, that was my tie-in to Simon the Sorcerer, was that Simon the Sorcerer wanted to use the apostles and the Holy Spirit to make himself look good. Right. <clears throat> Richard Nixon wanted to use evangelical leaders <clears throat> to make himself look good. All right. And um, and that, that was kind of my tie into that, man. Right. Um, so what does that have to do with peace? Well, on his tombstone, read the words. The greatest honor history can bestow is that of peacemaker. Are you serious? That is serious. Wow. Those are the words emblazoned on the tombstone of Richard Nixon. Read that again. The greatest honor history can bestow is that of peacemaker. And so that ties right in to what you were saying from the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. Wow. Uh, and so, peace... And uh, I, I pray that uh, President Nixon found peace uh, later on in life. He, he, ha he had a hard time. Uh, he, he was an enigma. He, he was a man who, who greatly wanted peace, but uh, 
I think in the days that he was raised and the days in which he led, got in the way of his peace, you know, going through World War II and then uh, later on in Vietnam. I, I, I think that, that had, took a toll on him. And uh, so I, I pray that he, he found peace later in life. It's fascinating, Mickey, to hear you know, your knowledge on um, world history and your love for politics and your love for tradition, your love for truth, your love for history. And what you don't know about Mick is Mickey is, is a true leader because he, uh, one of the attributes of a true leader is a leader is a reader. I want to repeat that. One of the attributes of a true leader is a leader is a reader. And um, Mickey is a reader. And uh, you know what you don't know before the show is he did a back handspring and cartwheel in this little back handspring over this book called Gladiator. He's going to take it home and read it. I got excited on the shelf oh, behind oh, us. Around. Gladiator, the Roman fighter's unofficial manual. But I commend you, brother, because you were able, and that's the beauty of truth and the beauty of tradition and history, because we're able to tie these truths and listen. Rather you want to believe it or not, all truth is God's truth. Mm -hmm. It belongs to God. Yeah. Rather it's in the Bible or not. And um, tying that in and with Richard Nixon, I didn't know a lot of that. And I didn't know how I was going to tie that in with Richard Nixon. Well, I mean, this but, is but, but kind of looking, looking kind of how the Lord worked with Bicycle Bill and Richard Nixon here. I mean, <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> and, and I mean, but, but seriously, that there's an objective that, that the Holy Spirit is leading us to hit tonight. And the Holy Spirit's not dead. Uh, he dwells within us, and He works through us. He is a He. And He is a He. He's not an It. Uh, that, that He's not some tangible force. That's called pantheism, and that's called the Star Wars, which is fun to watch. But I love Star Wars. Nevertheless, there's an objective here, and we hope and pray, like Simon the Sorcerer, that Nixon found peace. And that is, that's the thing. I mean, that, that's what this whole thing is about. Um, Listen, look, look, at, look at how these gospel writers started out their letters. Grace and peace unto you. Nixon had everything he wanted there at being a president, but he was still longing for that. Because, as I mentioned last night, as, as St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until we rest in thee, O God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I don't want to throw your story out there, but I'll, you know, I, I did. I was not raised in church, unlike Nixon, and unlike many others. I maybe went to church on an occasional Easter or Mother's Day, and to be honest with you, I hated it. I had the reading level of an eighth grader. Eighth grader. I didn't even graduate high school for crying out loud. I was involved in drug use, partying, uh, sexual immorality and all kinds of fornication and sins and, and these kind of things. And um, I kind of had an Apostle Paul radical conversion experience in, in, in a jail cell. And, and I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, God uses us, but it doesn't matter if you're a drug addict, okay, or if you're the richest man in the world and if you're the president, the, the human heart, because we've been made in the image of God, is longing is longing for God. And you may be out there listening now, and it, it doesn't matter what you believe. You, you cannot dispute the fact that if there, that, that your soul longs for God, and, the, and, and Jesus Christ is the only one that can set you free of your sins and, and put you in a state of being at peace with God through being reconciled to God. And that's what this whole thing's all about. And, um, Amazing, man. I, I didn't even know how you were going to go with that. I was thinking, okay, what's Simon the Sorcerer here got to do? But he was, and Nixon the same way. Beautiful, man. He was using Billy Graham to kind of make him feel spiritual. And listen, we got to go here for a minute. A lot of times that happens even in the church. Absolutely. You know, yes. people uh, will get baptized so they can get a baptism certificate. They'll, buddy, they got that certificate and they'll come to church and maybe being associated even with a preacher. Or, or, you know, or whatever, and we need to be associated with yeah, Christ. Absolutely. And yes, that's what this whole thing's about, and being in right relationship, being right with God, 
and um, and staying right with God. And uh, I want to look at Hebrews 12 uh, real quick here. And the Hebrew writer, after he gives the uh, chapter of faith, all the faith he rose, and then in chapter 12 he says Jesus is the the greatest example, fix your eyes on him, the author and perfecter, Hebrews 12, 2. And then Hebrews 12, 3, consider, kataneto in Greek, literally put it out before your mind and literally hold it in your hand and consider Christ. Do you guys know he's a Greek scholar? No, I'm not. It's incredible. I know enough Greek to make me dangerous. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful to um, my mentors, uh, Dan McDonald, Brent Calloway, and these men that really taught me the beginning stages of these things and but that's uh, consider Christ all right and then he talks about the discipline of God whoa whoa you whoa no I don't want to tell you hear about that so when he talks about God disciplines those whom he loves Hebrews 12 and uh, verse 6 he scourges every son whom he receives okay and then he talks about the holiness of God verse 10 For they disciplined us, talking about earthly parents, for a short time, seemed best to them. But he, that's God, disciplines us for our good. Why? So that we may share his holiness. So notice what the writer is doing, talking about the discipline of God, considering Christ, then tying in the holiness of God and the discipline are are inseparably linked. And, And even with Nixon, there was some discipline going on there because his heart was longing for peace even Simon the sorcerer wanting to bring in these apostles, wanting to buy this so they could make themselves look all high and spiritual. Okay, now, all discipline for the moment seems not to be enjoyable but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, there's a trajectory that the discipline is bringing about. What does about. it yield, Josh? A peaceful fruit of righteousness. Man, we've tied in the peace of God with Richard Nixon wanting to equate ourselves with God or a church or a super apostle, if you will. We've tied in the peace of God objectively by being justified by Christ. We've tied in the peace of God. Uh, John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. And now we're tying in the peace of God and the discipline of God because that brings about a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Verse 12, man, we're almost done. Therefore, look at this, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Verse 14, pursue what? Peace. Peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Wow. That'll preach. Amen, man. <laughs> wow. I mean, this this, this is a, a night of peace. It is. And thank you, Mickey. No, We've thank had, you. I mean, look at, look at how blessed we are to have this podcast, man, with, the, with each of us using our gifts and the knowledge of tying in world history. I mean, man, we were able to reach a vast amount of audience tonight in different areas of different people and uh, most importantly our own hearts yeah <clears throat> i love you brother you as well we love you jared he's the guy behind the camera uh, by the way. and typo edit no we don't edit then the last the last session go back and watch our last one um you know uh, there were some technical difficulties and and uh, and i was talking and uh and I was like, uh, gentlemen, are we getting it figured out? And then I said something on the last episode. I said, yeah, Jared, time out. I said, Jared's like Wilson off Home Alone. Home Improvement, I meant. My wife's like, did you say Home Alone? I said Home Alone, and it's Home That's Improvement. That's funny. I didn't even catch that. You hear his voice, but you never see him. Yeah. Well, you see the, the eyes. Right. Like the eyes, <laughs> yeah. eyes up, I think. Right there, yeah. On this day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On this day, go ahead, Mick. This is your ministry. Man, uh, we, I don't really know where to go with this, and there's there's some obscure things in this. Um, in 1823, President James Monroe uh, warned Europe to keep its hands off of both American continents, uh, which I think is a bold move for a 50 year old country. I think so. Um, I mean, you, we're, we were still pretty new 
uh, to the world scene for him yeah. to just say, yeah. you know what, back off. Yeah, and that's it bold, is. It man. Is bold. It, it takes um, courage. So he told them, you know, stay out. This is our land. Right. Uh, don't touch it. Yeah. Uh, a gentleman by the name of John Brown. John Brown. On this day in 1859, uh, was hanged. He was a radical abolitionist, and he was hanged in Charleston for treason yep. against Virginia. Uh, three years prior. Uh, Brown and his sons murdered five pro-slavery settlers in a raid in Kansas. His latest project uh, was to found a republic in the Appalachians as a base for abolitionists and runaways to fight slavery. Mm. On October 16th of 1859, uh, he and an armed force of 21 men attacked Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. Uh, if my daughter is is listening to this, Aubrey, uh, you should have read about this in your world history book. It was in there. I remember scan, uh, scanning over that. All right. Uh, anyway, ten of his own men were killed at Harper's Ferry. Uh, Brown was charged with treason. His trial was a sensation. Uh, he played uh, on abolitionist sympathies in the North, where he is being hailed as a martyr, but his extremism has horrified the South, where he is seen as a murderous traitor. The whole affair has served to widen the rift over abolition. Wow. Yeah. Emperor Napoleon, Notre Dame, what you got? Uh, on this day in 1804, Napoleon crowned himself uh, Emperor uh, of, of France, uh, taking over the monarchy. And on this day, birthdays. 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 Who was born Happy on this birthday. day? Alexander Haig. Oh. Alexander Haig, soldier, politician, uh, yeah, all around American guy, man. Uh, Haig. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. Haig, uh, Haig was born on this day in 1924. Okay. This day is December 2nd. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I should say that or not. Because, on this day. Yeah, the video will actually be released a few days after this. But yeah, this is the second. This is Table Talk, yeah. Ministry of First Christian Church of Pickneyville. We humbly ask and beseech that you would hit the bell icon, subscribe, like, don't like it, get her done. Yeah. Mick? Yes, and as uh, commentator Bill uh, O'Reilly used to say, let not your heart be troubled. All right, we love you all. Please uh, have faith in the Lord and uh, do not grow weary. Amen. Poke out Annie. Get her done. See, now I said that, you gotta do it. You gotta close with the song again. Here you got you, Granny. Everybody said it was a shame. Cause a mama was a working on a chain gang.